We're blowing up all content is sometimes recorded and we wait volume percent. So the weight, you know, a, a percent, we have different percentages. We have M over M. M over M is the most common. You know, M over M means what? Percentage by mass. Yeah, percentage by mass. It's the mass of component A over the total mass. Oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was lifting it up. I didn't realize it. Uh, oh. <laughs> well, I should have known. I was playing with this yesterday. Uh, mass of component A over the whole mass. We have um, V over V. The percent V over V is what? Is that the body? Yeah, percent. Volume of component A over total volume. We have um, a mole percent, yeah, or atom percent, you know, depending on what we're looking at, or atom or molecule. The same thing down here. And then we have these ones that are kind of mixed, like an M over V percent. M over V percent is common in biology. Let's say um, when they look at the concentration of stuff in your blood and they equate it to um, salt, you know, they have an equivalent. Like this, this a solution called isotonic has the same concentration of blood. And it would be a 0.9 percent salt solution. It's an M over V. And so we have lots of different percentages. If it's not specified, um, then we normally assume it's a what? What's the most common? The M over M. Percent by mass. Percent by mass is the most common. But sometimes you can't assume it. It's like that 1.77. You know, the pilot assumed that was in kilograms per liter, which would be the same as mil excuse me, grams per milliliter. Is that's a very common unit, you know, grams per milliliter. I heard out of those one. The same thing uh, that I say about percent, we can say about part per million and part per billion. Most parts per million are parts per million in terms of what? In, in terms of, like the parts per million, the two parts per million that we've already used were parts per million by what? Mass by mass. There are a lot of parts per million by mole, uh, by molecule, by atom. In fact, in chapter two, we're going to look at percentages by atom, uh, by molecules. All right, so back finally. All right, so uh, blood alcohol content of 0.10% corresponds to 0 0.10 grams of ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol um, has another name. What's the other name for ethyl alcohol? Ethanol. Ethanol. So we have 0.10% ethanol is abbreviated ETOH, which means in this case it's a M over V percent. So it means 0 0.10 grams of ETOH per 100 what milliliters of blood. We 
In many jurisdictions, a person is considered legally intoxicated if his or her <coughs> blood alcohol content is 0.10%. In California, it's not 0.10. What is it? 0.08. Yeah. Suppose that a 68 kilogram person has a total blood volume of 5.4 liters. And so we're going to have a, a, a 68 uh, kilogram person. And the blood volume is 5.4 liters of blood. Oops. Um, it breaks down the ethyl alcohol at a rate of 0 0.10 grams per hour. So, um, 0 0.10 grams per hour. So, um, we'll have to be a little bit more descriptive. Grams of what? Ethanol. Okay, and this is going to be um, the breaks down, which would mean uh, metabolized or digested or whatever you want to write. So, we'll just say uh, grams of ethanol consumed. I shouldn't say consume, just say um, Oh, yeah, sorry. 10 grams per hour. How many sick kids? Well, that's pretty precise 10.0. Mm -hmm. You'd think there would be more variation. You wouldn't think it'd be so precise. Uh, some, some people. Okay. <laughs> All right. There's a footnote. Well, here it is. The rate at which ethyl alcohol is broken down varies dramatically from person to person. The volume given here for the rate is a realistic, but not necessarily accurate one. Okay. <laughs> we'll just uh, assume that. How many uh, 145 milliliter glasses of wine? Okay. So 145 milliliters per glass. Consumed over three hours. This is over three hours. We'll produce a BAC of 0.10% in this 68 kilogram person. So ultimately, we we'll want a BAC of 0.10%, which is already up here. Um, Assume the wine has a density of 1.01 grams per milliliter. Okay, so 1.01 grams of wine per milliliter of wine. And it's 11.5% ethyl alcohol by mass. And so that means 11.5%, that means 11.5 grams out of 100 grams. So 11.5 grams of what? Ethanol for 100 grams of wine. All right, so we're just going to treat this as a dimensional analysis problem, and we have a whole bunch of uh, versions. But where should we start? There. Mm -hmm. Okay. How much ethanol needs to be in the blood? Right there. Okay. Then yeah, we can start off with five point four liters and then figure out how much ethanol we can have there. Okay, let's start with this. What about the three hours? It's also extensive. Mm -hmm. Two separate. One word yeah, two maybe two separate. Hours. We'll have to figure it out. Let's just start with one or the other. We'll start with 5.4 liters of blood, and then see where we can go from, from this.
So 5.4 liters of lead, and then I need to get rid of either liters or liters of blood. Um, there's nothing with liters of blood, is there? No. And so I'm going to get rid of liters, and then convert that to milliliters. So we'll go milliliters to liters. And so that gives me milliliters of blood. And so I want to get rid of milliliters or milliliters of blood. Um, here, there is something that has milliliters of blood, isn't there? Okay, yeah. Um, we could, uh, yeah, we can use the blood alcohol. All right. Or we could use the density of blood. Do we have the density of blood? Okay, just the density of wine. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of milliliters of blood. There's 100 milliliters of blood. Um, we can have 0 0.10 grams of ethanol. All so this tells us how much ethanol uh, it's going to take to... Yeah, to get a BAC of 0.10%. But we don't necessarily want how many grams of ethanol. We want to know how many glasses of wine this person can consume. So let's just continue with this here. So um, we're going to get rid of grams of ethanol, or grams. Is there something that gets rid of grams of ethanol? Yeah, the ethanol in wine is 11.5%. And so what we can say is we have 11.5 grams of ethanol for every 100 grams of wine. And then what? In the wine, yeah. We're going to get rid of grams of wine. Either grams or grams of wine, but in this case we can get rid of grams of wine. And so looking at the grams of wine, it's going to be 1.01 uh, grams of wine per one milliliter. And so grams of wine cancel, but it leaves me with milliliters of wine. And then I can go to glasses of wine. And so uh, what was that, 145 milliliters of glass? So 145 milliliters. Glass. Okay, and this is going to give me how many glasses of wine uh, this person can consume. Let's calculate. Five point four. Um, times a thousand times point one divided by one hundred times one hundred divided by eleven point five divided by one point oh one divided by one forty five. What did you guys get? Wow. That's not much. A third of a glass of wine? That's awfully, uh, awfully small. I mean, it seems to be. I mean, you, even when you get your driver's license, this is the recommendation. You could have one drink in how many hours and still be under? Is it eight hours? One drink in eight hours? One serving... Per hour. hour, something like that. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, well, now we got to figure out what, what to do with the three hours. Is that 0 0.306 glasses per hour or like the whole no, time? No, that's just the initial. So he's trying to have a majority. Yeah. Okay. 
So that gets you to the yeah, that gets zero point one zero right. or whatever. What was it? How many glasses consumed over three hours okay. will produce that blood alcohol? All right. So what we have to now th this is changing because the as soon as this person drinks it, um, their body is going to start metabolizing it at a rate of. Uh, 10 grams per hour. That's 10 grams of ethyl alcohol per hour. So, um, how should we do this? And then, does, it, does the weight factor into this too? Or are they just giving us this person's weight? Yeah, they're just giving us the person's weight. Um, just as a reference. Like as a blood. reference because of the blood volume. So, okay. I don't think we need to use it. Okay. I think it's just a bit of extra information. And so we got to figure out how to how to deal with this three hour thing. Uh huh. I, this is what I did. I, I didn't do this thing. Okay. This reference. I found how much alcohol um, a cup of glass of wine would give you. Mm -hmm. um, I found uh, I I knew we needed. I, I found how much alcohol you would need to get zero point one grams. Okay. And so then I did. I just alcohol we would need mm -hmm. minus thirty grams because we would subtract it equal. To eventually get to the five, eventually get to the amount of alcohol we will need. Okay, that sounds good. So you didn't even start it like this. Um, yeah, we'll take a look at that. I mean, should we just should we just start all over again? What do you think? I did it like this too, and I did the three hours. Okay. So three hours, um, and then to get to how much was broken down during those three hours. Uh huh. And then just add that uh, to how much is needed to be drunk. And okay. That's okay. And so you have this, and then you did the three hours? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try that. Because this is the other extent of property here. And then we'll go back and look at the, the other way. So three hours here. Um, so we need to get rid of hours or... Well, we just need to get rid of hours. Um, do we have something with hours? Yeah, we have. We have um, 10.0 grams of ETOH per hour. Is that what you did, William? Okay, and so the hours. Now we have grams of ethanol. And then what did you do? Uh, 100 grams of wine to 11.5 grams of ethanol. Okay, 100 grams of wine. For 11.5 grams of ethanol. Uh -huh. and so you have grams of wine, and then what? And then a one milliliter to uh, 1.01 grams of wine. Okay. Um, and then uh, to glasses, so the 1.5. Okay, and then what did you get for the number here? Um, well, I actually did the calculation on that. So. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and calculate this. So three plus, I mean, three times, three times 10 times 100 divided by 11.5 divided by 1.01 .01 divided by 145. So 1.7813 glasses. And so, how do you interpret this 1.7813 glasses? If a person drank 1.78 glasses of wine in a three hour, let's say, the, let's say they drank it all at once, right at the beginning. So at time zero, they drank 1.78 glasses. And then three hours later, what would, it, what, what would their blood alcohol content be? Yeah. So if they drank this right at the beginning, and we call that time zero, then three hours later, there'd be no blood alcohol. Okay, then what did you do, Lily? Then just add them together. Then just add them together. And so um, that means uh, if they go down to zero, that means they can drink a little bit more. And this would bring their blood alcohol. So at the end of the three hours, they consume this, and then they'll be back up. To 0.10. And so let's just add those plus 
32063. And so, did you get the same answer? Is this 2.1019 glasses? Good. And so, how many sig figs are we allowed here? Two, so just 2.1 glasses. And you started off with this. I, I started off with the, the blood, so I tried to figure out how much of it was working on So I did the, the, the blood alcohol. So I did the first three up there. Uh huh. And then top left. Yeah. Now the top first three, you know, 4.5 times 1,000 times 10 times 0.1, 0.1 grams. Okay. And that's like, okay, that's the amount of alcohol. Okay. And now that went to 5. .5. Okay. Oh, I see. And then you got the grams of alcohol. And for, 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 uh, for top, right? Yeah. That's what I did. That's yeah, what you did too. Yeah, yeah that's did, that's a good way too. And I did alcohol minus uh, how alcohol we could make, right? Minus thirty grams. You have to keep the target amount. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. We can figure out this is how many cups of alcohol, and uh -huh. just need this amount of alcohol. Okay. Did Did you guys get that? Yeah. Yeah. We could approach it from that way too. Um, just looking at the alcohol. That's what we have. All right, so this is the um, this is a pretty challenging problem. This is number eighty nine, the last of the challenging problems. So once we get an idea of what the challenging problems are like, then you know we can feel a little bit more you know um, confident maybe for the test or comfortable in going in the test. You know, this is this is why I like doing this because I can feel a little bit more comfortable if I have the homework problems down. Uh, although you might do this, you might you might have to review it. You know, I reviewed the homework like I reviewed the lecture notes. You know, I just flipped through my homework. I kept the homework notebook too. I just flipped through the homework. And so I had it pretty well memorized. And so I had the lecture and the homework memorized for the test. So if anything came from the lecture or the homework, um, then I was, <clears throat> I thought those were easy, easy give me problems. And um, oftentimes there were problems like that, which I felt very lucky to, to have gotten. Um, but at, at, you know, when I was there at UCLA, a lot of instructors didn't want, like, if I could record the lecture, um, that was the best. But a lot of professors didn't want any recording at all. You know, so you had to take notes as fast as possible. This is why in high school, my, um, one of my high school teachers always said, if you want to get straight A's, take shorthand. You know, if you know shorthand, then you can write extremely fast and then you don't miss anything. The problem is, is when I take lecture notes, I miss maybe 40% of the information. And, and sometimes you can recover that 40% by comparing with other people. Or sometimes you just remember it and then write it down later. So if I can get it in the, you know, like in the 90s, then that's always good. But, uh, but anyway, but if the lecture was recorded, then I, I found those classes a lot easier because then I can just go back through and listen to that. And I can get 100% of everything covered in class. Is that what you record now? Yeah, that's one of the reasons I record now. Anyway, we're going to move on to the next chapter here, chapter two. This is um, pretty much a review of atomic, atomic structure, atomic theory. This is like in M4, you know, atomic theory part one. We don't talk about the structure of the electrons here. We just talk about the basic structure of the atoms. So um, early atomic theory discussed the structure of the atoms. Atoms were composed long ago. Um, you know who, who's often credited for atoms? Um, well, anyway, um, back to ancient times. But it's maybe the proposal of atoms or the hypothesis of atoms. But the theory has to, you know, theory has to be more substantial. 
And so maybe we, we shouldn't say, you know, the atomic theory was proposed in ancient Greece or wherever, um, because maybe it wasn't wide, there wasn't widespread adoption. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about uh, atomic theory. Electrons and other discoveries in atomic physics. Two, three is nuclear atom. Two, four is chemical elements. Two, five is atomic mass. Two, six is introduction to the periodic table. We're going to cover the periodic table in more depth when we get to the atomic mass. Two, seven, the concept of the mole in Avogadro number. Using the mole in calculation. And so uh, let's take a look at atoms. Um, what, what's your picture of atoms right now? When you think of atoms. Uh, so let's just take a, a typical atom. Uh, how would you draw it? Yeah, you'd have a little tiny nucleus. And then you have this big atom where you have uh, electrons. And so I'm going to um, make the nucleus a bit bigger since it's too hard to see here. But what's inside the nucleus? Protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons. Protons are, are often given the symbol P or P plus. Neutrons are N or N zero. Zero being the charge on the neutrons. Okay, what do you know about protons and neutrons? They, hold the, they make up most of the mass. Of the atom. Yeah, they make up most of the mass of the atom. Good. So let's see. What is? Do you know the mass of a proton and neutron? Roughly, what is the mass of a proton? One point zero zero one. Close. It's about one what? Yeah, one atomic mass unit. That's good. So that's easy to remember. And the mass of a neutron, is it exactly the same as a proton? Very similar. And so let's take a look at the uh, masses of these things here. It comes in later. We combine everything together. We have a little table in here that uh, summarizes the charge and the masses here. Table 2 1. Oh, wait. Uh -huh. I'm just a, what unit would you use to describe the weight of the proton? Would you use moles or moles? The weight we use, do um, you have a choice? We could use grams. In chemistry, we use grams. In physics, we use kilograms. So if you're taking physics, these are all off by three orders of magnitude. And so um, it'd be three orders of magnitude smaller. And so, like the mass of an electron in physics is 10 to minus 31 uh, kilograms. But we could use um, we could use grams. So the proton weighs 1.6726 times 10 to minus 1.6726 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. Uh, the neutron weighs 1.6749 times 10 to the minus 24 gram. And then the electrons are going to be out here in what they call empty space. But, but is it really empty space? It's empty in the sense that there's no matter there. You know? But it's not completely empty. You know, um, like... <clears throat> For example, um, do you know the Earth generates a magnetic field? Do you feel it right now? You don't feel it, but it, it's there. It's, it's everywhere around us. And uh, you could actually see it if you put, like, um, this, this is something they do in geology. In geology, they can tell, you know, the deposition of, of lava. You know, lava comes in, and then it, it solidifies. And it, if it solidifies slowly enough, then it, the little crystals have enough time to align with Earth's magnetic field. And so they can see, you know, is it still aligned with the Earth's magnetic field or did it move, you know? 
in some way because of the direction the crystals are pointing. And so you can see it in different ways. You can take iron filings. You, you might have seen this when you have a magnet with the north and south pole, then you, you have these iron filings and it makes field lines like that. Have you seen that? And so when you spread out the filings, then you can see the field. Well, in, in empty space, you know, there's gravitational field, right? But there's also something called, um, have you heard of the Higgs field? Higgs field? Yeah. There's a Higgs field. I saw a really interesting simulation of the Higgs field. Let's see if I can bring that up. I forgot to check that Higgs field simulation. Yeah. So there's that. Let's see. I need to find it. Oh, here it is. Well, anyway, there's that Higgs field. When you see the simulation, it's kind of interesting. Um, but it's there. And so it's not a vacuum. I mean, it is a vacuum. A vacuum just means there's no gas in there. And so there's no gas in there, but there's this field. And um, that's where the electrons reside. Well, the field's everywhere. And the electrons um, are a lot heavier or a lot lighter than Lighter. About how many times lighter? Uh, a thousand? Uh, a thousand is getting closer, at right order of magnitude. What is it? Uh, uh, 10,000 is too much. 5,000 is too much. It's 1,850 times light, lighter, but people just say 2,000 times lighter, you know, roughly. So electrons about 2,000 times lighter. So how much does electron weigh? An electron is going to weigh um, 9.1094 oh, 9 times 10 to the minus 28 grams. Do you want to weigh these things in grams? What's the metric prefix? Do you know the metric prefix for 10 to the minus 24? No. Maybe we can just combine some. What, what, what is a pico? A pico is... 10 to the negative 12. So we might say um, a neutron weighs 1.6749 pico picogram. <laughs> so if we say pico pico, then that adds up to 10 to the minus 24, right? So that's possible. We could do that, pico picogram. But there's probably a metric prefix for it. Um, it's probably not an appendix either. And so rather than um, doing that, we're going to use uh, different units. Um, to weigh these, and we're going to use the atomic mass unit, U. And so in terms of atomic mass unit, it's a bit easier. 1.0073 U for the proton, and um, 1.0087 U for the neutron. Well, the neutron is actually a little bit heavier. Not by much. You know, just a tiny fraction heavier than the proton. Did you? What is it? Hmm? Is it on page? Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that, that's good. Um, Yoda, Yoda, I don't know. Yoda, Yoda. Um, page 9 of the textbook? That's actually impressive. Uh, oh, wow. I didn't know. Oh, no, I, guess, I guess there's I should a, read there's the book. There's a Zeta. I'm kind of resonating more with Pico Pico. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say <laughs> All right. Well, you could, of course, you could use metric prefixes for this, but then nobody will know what you're talking about. <laughs> you go, what? Um, I'm surprised it goes that far. Yeah, I'm sure we'll go for it. Well, I, you know, when I was getting into these long chain organics, you know, um, do you do you know uh, if you have one carbon, what the prefix is? Meth. <laughs> so methanol is one carbon. Ethanol is two. Two. Prop is three. Bute 
four. So I was working with these 22 carbon. And so I was thinking, what is the, what is the base that they call the parent name? What is the parent name for 22 carbon chain of carbon atoms, you know? And, um, I, well, then I found it. It's like ICO. ICO is 20, and then ICO is like 22. So I was working with the... But then a lot of people, you know, when I say that, they don't know. <laughs> so, uh, how many is that? <laughs> All right, and so the mass of the electron, oh, thanks for that bit of information. <laughs> Memorize that. What would the negative 28 be? Well, 27 is Ronto. Ronto? And then it goes to 30. Oh, okay, so oh, we really? probably convert that to 10 to negative 27 and then use that. That would be good. But, a lot of yachts. <laughs> All right, so the first thing is, what is this? Tell me, how, uh, how is a U defined? Is there, a, you know, a kilogram is defined by some kind of mass in Paris, France. But they're trying to get away from that because, you know, who has access to that, you know? And so they're coming up with a, a fundamental um, <clears throat> definition of the kilogram. But what is the uh, fundamental definition of the U? The carbon chloride. Yeah, okay. It's, a, it's based on a carbon 12 atom. And so, um, what is it? One carbon 12 atom is defined as, well, the mass. The mass of one carbon 12 atom is defined as 12 U or AMU. And that's the definition. And so do they store this carbon-12 atom in some vault in, in France? It's a very special carbon-12 atom. Or are all carbon-12 atoms in nature the same? They're all exactly the same. And so this is, you know, there's so much carbon around, like charcoal, graphite, etc. that um, you can easily get a carbon-12 atom. Well, how can you get a carbon-12 atom? Well, um, you can take a piece of uh, graphite or a piece of coal or a piece of something, and then um, what they can do is they can hit it with a laser. And so they hit it with a laser, which is high intensity light, and then it gets so hot it vaporizes the carbon 12 atom into the gaseous state. So this is a solid here. And so you have a, a source. But the thing is, um, not only um, will you uh, vaporize carbon-12 atoms, but you'll also vaporize what? Carbon-13. And so it's about 98% carbon-12 and about, well, less than 2% carbon-13. And so it's mostly carbon-12. You know what we call this? Actually, what is the, um, let, me, let me give you the precise numbers for that. Um, if I'm going to look up the precise numbers, what do I call that? You know, what do I call the percent? Like, if I had a piece of diamond, you know, a piece of diamond and a piece of graphite are going to have the same ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13. Yeah, good. The, the natural abundance. It's called the percent natural abundance. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, type in natural abundance um, table of isotopes. We call these isotopes. So isotopes, what's the difference between a carbon-12 and a carbon-13 atom? The number of neutrons, right? And can you tell me how many um, protons a carbon-12 has? 12 protons? Not 12. It has 6 protons. How did you figure that out? Yeah, it's number 6. Yeah, it's number 6 on the periodic table. Number 6. Those, those red numbers at the top are the um, what we call the atomic number, and the atomic number, each element is defined by the number of protons, right? And so if you have seven protons, then it's no longer carbon. If you have seven protons, it's nitrogen. Um, because it, the atomic number depends on the element, I don't bother writing it in here. I'm supposed to write down here, what am I supposed to write? I'm supposed to write six. But it's a bit redundant. I don't need to write six because carbon's element number six. 
And so oftentimes people just don't write this here. But I guess to emphasize it, we'll put this there. The number at the top here, the 12, is called the what? So this is called the atomic number. And this 12 here is not, um, it's close. It's, it's called the mass number. The mass number, is that the mass of the car? Well, it, it, it is the mass, isn't it? 12 and 12. It's close to it, right? The mass number is actually not the mass. It's not equal to the mass. It's just close to the mass. Mm -hmm. And so what we should say is it's approximately equal to the mass because the mass number is actually equal to or defined as what? The number of protons plus number of neutrons. And so this tells us the composition. Now, up at the top right, we write the charge. And so oftentimes we, we don't, I mean, if the charge is zero, we don't write zero here. But if, if there's a charge on there, we write the charge here on the upper right. And since there's no charge here, that tells us how many electrons we have. How many electrons do we have here? Six electrons. So we know the composition of the carbon-12 isotope. A single atom of carbon-12 is called a nuclid. nuclid. And we also know the um, composition of nuclid of, of carbon-13. Carbon-13 would have how many protons? Six. How many neutrons? Seven. And how many electrons? Six. 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 All right, so if we look at the um, table of natural abundance, Carbon-12 is uh, actually uh, 98.89%. And when you look at the atomic mass, do you see that? Atomic mass 12, formally by definition, because this is the definition of the atomic mass in the scale. Do you know that this is really weird? Is there anything that weighs exactly one U? No. There's nothing that weighs exactly one U. There's something that weighs exactly 12 U, and what is that? Carbon 12. In the 1950s or so, um, they used to use oxygen 16 instead. You know, Because when you inhale oxygen, you're inhaling oxygen 16, oxygen 17, and oxygen 18. And so they used to use it. And you think, why not continue to use it? Well, working with gases is a bit more of a headache than working with a solid piece of graphite or a piece of coal or something like that. Even though you need a laser to ablate this, that is, to vaporize it. Um, working with gases, you need compressed cylinder, you have impurities in there. You can get... Remember when I was talking about primary standards? What's a primary standard? Yeah, something that can be used to calibrate. So number one, you need high purity. Well, it's easy to get high purity graphite. Um, number two, it has to be stable. Graphite's pretty stable. Oxygen's somewhat reactive. It likes to react with its own thing. Okay. So um, they switch. So that means if you look at old masses in, in an old periodic table, they're different. You know, oxygen's 16 is exactly 16, so the masses are slightly different. But that's so long ago. You don't really, people don't worry about it so much anymore. Anyway, uh, this is 98.89%. And so if I had a piece of graphite or a piece of diamond, 98.89% of it consists of carbon-12. Now, does that mean that 98.89 grams of carbon-12 atom in 100 grams of graphite or 100 grams of diamond or 100 grams of whatever? Is that what that means? No. That's not what this means. This means 98.89% of the carbon atoms are carbon-12. Now, can you have a 0.89 of a carbon atom? Because if I do this, that means it's 
carbon-12 atoms for every 100 carbon atoms. No, we, we aren't going to have a fraction of a carbon atom. We can't. The atom is the smallest piece of carbon that we can have. Um, back, you know, back in the times of the ancient Greeks, um, they were thinking that um, carbon and whatever can be divided to infinitesimally small pieces. And so there was no limit. And then you had another group who were saying, no, it cannot be divided into infinitely small pieces. There's going to be a limit, and that limit's going to be the atom. So which would you have supported? Which hypothesis would you have supported? That matter can be infinitely divided or that there's a limit? And then if you support one, I mean, what is your justification for supporting that hypothesis? Uh-huh. Oh, uh, I can answer. I would support the fact that there would be a limit because there is a finite amount of resources on Earth. There is no justification for a limitless source. If you were able to split a carbon atom infinitely into an infinitely small amount, mm -hmm. that means that you would have an infinite resource of carbon to always split because it would get infinitely smaller. And that's not possible. Okay. Okay. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. Motion. You just um, now you just have to convince everybody else of your hypothesis, and then you respond. Believe me, I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, um, but I, I see what you're saying. I mean, you, you could distribute it. If, yeah, if, if gold were infinitely divisible, then you could give everyone gold. Although it'd probably end up splitting. Uh, well, there are only two. Um, but, you know, this is why back then, what was the evidence that supported each hypothesis? That's what you consider. You know, what was that hypothesis based on? And so we look at that. Um, but it turns out that eventually uh, the atom won out. And, uh, and what was the reason? Was it because of this? I mean, if it were infinitely divisible, then you have an infinite resource of carbon atoms. Or was there another argument that supported atoms? And you should know the other argument that supported atoms. What was the other argument that supported atoms? And so this is why atomic theory, even though it was for atoms were proposed well before um, atomic theory came about. Atomic theory came about when, roughly? Uh, what, 1800s? 1800s. Um, you know the name of the scientist who's given credit for uh, proposing the first meaningful atomic theory? Dalton. You know Dalton's atomic theory? And so Dalton proposed it, and um, he had some evidence for atomic theory. What was the evidence that he used to support his hypothesis for atomic theory? I need to come back to this page. It was eight forty four. Eight forty four. Here, um, Dalton's atomic theory, uh, from 1803 to 1808, you don't need to know the date. John Dalton, an English school teacher, used the two fundamental laws of chemical combination just described as the basis of atomic theory. You, you know the basis of, of Dalton's atomic theory. Each chemical element is composed of minute individual, indivisible particles called atoms. 
Atoms can be neither created nor destroyed during a chemical change. You don't have to have these memorized. Two, all atoms of an element are alike in mass and other properties, but the atoms of one element are different from those of all other elements. This is no longer true because of light. Three, in each of their compounds, different elements combine in simple numerical ratio. For example, one atom of A to one atom of B, AB, or one atom of A to two atoms of B, AB2. And so what was the evidence that supported his hypothesis? Yeah. The law of conservation of mass and the law of oh, general <laughs> general no, relativity came much later. Uh, no. Law of constant composition. Water is always two hydrogens, one oxygen. It's not 2.1 in some regions and 1.9 in other regions. You know, it's always fixed. It's a constant composition. And then the law of conservation of mass. You know, all the atoms, you never, you never lose atoms, you never gain atoms. Just when you have a chemical reaction, the atoms are just rearranged. And so you're going to start off with the same total number of atoms as you end up with. And so the mass doesn't change. And so those were the um, two um, pieces of evidence that he used to convince other scientists that matter was not infinitely divisible. But all theories, you know, should be a fundamental description. So that's the fundamental description of what's happening in a chemical reaction. The atoms are just rearranging. And um, when you have more, make a compound, you, you, you have to have a simple whole number ratio. But theories should give you a fundamental description of what's going on, the observations. You know, the observations led to the laws, which led to the theory. But theories should do one other thing, what predict. And so, uh, like all good theories, Dalton's atomic theory led to the prediction of the law of multiple proportions. The law of multiple proportions is this thing with the whole number ratio that follows. Kind of like the law of optimal composition, but, you know, it could be like H2O, H2O2, but not H2.1, O1.9, you know, something like that. And so that's the law of multiple proportions. And so um, we know that uh, matter, you know, the smallest piece of matter is going to be the atom. And in the sample of carbon, we're going to have carbon-12 and carbon-13. Are there other isotopes of carbon? Yeah, there are other isotopes of carbon, but you know what they are? Like, have you heard of carbon-14? <laughs> Yeah, carbon-14 is not stable. They are radioactive. They, they form from radioactive processes. And so we don't, if it's, if it's um, radioactive, then we don't call it naturally abundant. So these are the percent natural abundances. But if we look at the uh, isotopes in general, since those are short-lived, some of those isotopes, they don't have uh, a very long half-life. Half-life tells you how long it takes for or 50% of the atoms to decay. Um, we don't include that, so there's no carbon-14 here. And then there are other isotopes in addition um, that are radioactive. And so if I wanted that, I have the table of natural abundance. The table of natural abundance is not going to show the radioactive ones. If I wanted the table of um, all the isotopes, then I'd look for something else. I'd look for the table of isotopes. This one is an appendix, one of the appendices in our book. And so, if I'm interested in all the isotopes that have been made or synthesized, a lot of these can be made through uh, nuclear processes. Table of isotopes. Actually, we can even look at this decay data here. So here we can see. 
the um, other ice floods that are found. So 12 and 13 are natural. Mm -hmm. There's no decay load here. This is the decay load. Like beta, these are beta, beta radiation, which I didn't talk about. That's also particle radiation. Other things. The carbon 12 and 13 are stable. Carbon 14 has a half life of 5,730 years. But some of these are very short. Like, for example, carbon 9 has a half life of 126.5 milliseconds. Well, this one's 14 milliseconds, so carbon 20. Some of these haven't even been characterized very well, so there's no data here carbon 21, carbon 22. But that, that would be a table of all the isotopes that have been determined um, so far. So uh, we can't have fractions of atoms, so there are different ways of thinking about this. Um, one way I like to think about this is um, this. I like to move the decimal place over. So I, I'd move it two over. So what I'd say is this. If I move it two over, I'd say 9,889 carbon-12 atoms. And then move this two over. If I move this two over, it'd be 10,000. And so if I had 10,000 carbon atoms, 9,889 of those would be carbon 12. And if I had 10,000 carbon atoms, I'd only have 111 carbon 13. And so 111 carbon 13 per 10,000 carbon atoms. And so this is um, what we call a mole percent, atom percent, or molecule, although these aren't molecules. So. so the two most common ones are percent by mass and percent by mole, like this. Okay. And so air. Air, do you know what the percent um, oxygen in air is? Well, the percent oxygen in air is about 21%. So air consists of 21% oxygen. Does that mean if you have 100 grams of air, you have 21 grams of oxygen? No. You know what it means? It means if you have 100 molecules of air, you know, molecules of air would be nitrogen molecules, oxygen molecules, and atoms, you know, whatever. And so if you have 100 particles of air, then out of the 100 particles, how many of those are oxygen molecules? 21. So that's what we call a mole percent. And so you have to be careful because people get it mixed up all the time. Um, people just assume, you know, if you say 21% um, oxygen air, people assume you, you know what they're talking about. They, sometimes they just don't tell you it's present by mole. Um, okay, so uh, there's a, a lot of things we're going to talk about um, here as well, so we're going to continue um, with this. But we talked about um, this. Now, the next thing is, um, how did we get these masses? Do we know? Okay. Um, like, for example, if I wanted to weigh carbon-12 nuclear, what instrument would you use to weigh it? Mass spectrometer. So, uh, do you guys are you guys familiar with the mass spectrometer? Yeah. Because we can't weigh single atoms. And so, what you do is you shoot this. So, you, you get a laser, hit this, vaporize a carbon 12, feed it through a mass spectrometer. When you feed it through a mass spectrometer, the carbon 12 travels. Let's show mass spectrometer here. And so, we all need to know the mass spectrometer. But wait a minute. You know, doing a mass spectrometer experiment is a lot of work, you know, because if, if I take a piece of graphite, and I wouldn't want to use diamond, maybe, for this expensive experiment. Let's take a piece of graphite. Um, you got to vaporize it, you got to feed it into mass spectrometer. Mass spectrometer is not so easy, because in mass spectrometer, you got to suck all the air out of there. If you don't suck all the air, and it's hard to suck all the air out, you can't get a perfect vacuum. So you get a high vacuum, an ultra high vacuum, so that the, the air molecules don't interfere with what's going on. So you, you get your um, 
atoms vaporize. So they're using a heater to vaporize the sample, but maybe a heater is not enough. You know, if you heat a piece of graphite, nothing's going to happen. So you've got to use a laser for that. So you vaporize it. But some samples are easy to vaporize, so you can use a heater. And the atoms are neutral. You know, there's no charge here. And so we got to make a charge on this. And so to make a charge, there are different ways we can make a charge. One is we can shoot a beam of electrons, you know, like lightning. If you have a high enough voltage, you'll get a beam of electrons. A beam of electrons will be lightning. But do we have lightning bolts in here? No, we don't have lightning bolts. So, you know, lightning bolts require a very high voltage. And they're very jagged because there's lots of air molecules interfering with the path. But if we have a vacuum, then we can have a very nice beam of electrons. You know what a nice beam of electrons is when it's at low, low pressure? And we used to have one, but somebody broke it. Um, we, we had a CRT. Have you ever heard of a CRT? Um, well, not this CRT. <laughs> but, you know, it used to be so easy to uh, search stuff. These are old CRT television screens and monitors. Good thing these are not so easy to, to read. It, the cathode ray tubes, cathode ray tubes have been around a long time. And so you get a low voltage gas in here, and then you create a voltage. The voltage is going to be over 1,000 volts, maybe 2,000 volts should be enough. And then what happens is um, you can get a beam of electrons in here. That beam of electrons can be termed an electron gun. And so you have an electron beam source. Um, but there's not just electron beams. You can also shoot small atoms, and you can shoot molecules, as long as they have a charge. Because how do you accelerate it? You accelerate them by giving them a charge. So what, what happens is an electron will get stuck onto the carbon atom and, and give it a charge. Or an electron could get knocked off a carbon atom depending on how energetic the beam of electrons are. So either electron gets stuck or electron gets knocked off. It creates a charge. If it creates a charge, then we, oh, we put some um, electric field here. Electric field is, you know, negative likes positive. Coulomb's law is this. Opposite charges attract, um, like charges repel. And so um, you accelerate it using these plates here. And then the plates have a slit here, and then you have a beam of uh, atoms go through here. And depending on how heavy they are, if they're heavy, they have a lot of inertia and get over here. If they're light, then they can be deflected. This is a magnet here. And so it's deflected by a magnetic field. It's just like the light of the And so what, what we see is this. If we put in um, carbon in here, we see two stripes on the detector. One strike corresponds to carbon 12, the other strike corresponds to carbon 13. Okay. And so for every 10,000 strikes, you know, we got about 9,900 from carbon 12 and only about 100 from carbon 13. So the signal is going to be quite a bit different. And so what we do is we get a mass spectrum from this. And the mass spectrum is going to have the mass here, and it's going to have the percent or the intensity. Percent or intensity. You can, you, you know, because the computers, you can have whatever units you want. And then carbon 12 is going to hit here, it's going to give you a big peak. And then carbon 13 is going to hit here, and it's going to give you a small peak. And so this peak is due to the carbon-12, this peak is due to the carbon-13. Now, based on the peak height, that's where we get the percent natural abundance. So the percent natural abundance comes from the mass spectrometer, and it's just measuring the peak heights here. And so these have to add up to 100%, so you just figure out what it is. And then we calibrate this and use some physics. So where the carbon-12 sits, here, we call that exactly 12U. So the carbon-12 strikes here, this is exactly 12U, and then we use a little bit of physics to figure out the mass of carbon-13. And so the carbon-13 is going to be right here. The 
carbon-13 is going to be 13.00335 U. And so 13.0035 U. This is a very precise, this is a very high precision instrument. No high precision instrument because it can um, 00335, 00335. How many sig figs is that? Two, four, six, seven sig figs. How many decimal places? Two, four, five decimal places, seven sig figs. This is very high precision. So this can measure minute differences in, in mass. Um, 13 is about 13. You know? So this is why the mass number is close to the, the actual mass. But, you know, if you go through this every day, let's say you go through your notes every day, then something might hit you. Something might hit you like, you know, if we know carbon-12, carbon-12 consists of how many protons? And how many neutrons? And how many electrons? And we know how much a proton weighs, we know how much a neutron weighs, and we know how much electron weighs. Mm -hmm. So do we have to use a mass spectrometer? Yeah. Why don't I just do six times the mass of the proton plus six times the mass of the neutron plus the mass of the electrons combine it all and get the mass of the atom? Does that work? No. No. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work because of the mass defect. Right. It, um, do you guys know the mass defect? Everybody should know the mass defect. We have to weigh the we have to weigh these using a mass spectrometer. We can't add up the masses. The masses don't add. And so um, these, these have to be weighed. Uh, the sum of the masses of what we call the subatomic particles, which are these, these are the subatomic particle, is not equal to the mass of the nuclein. And um, the reason for that is the mass defect. Do you know the forces um, in nature? What are the forces in nature? Magnetism, gravity. And so um, one, we have electrical. Electrical and magnetic are often combined. And so electrical and magnetic, because they interact. And, uh, so if you have... Um, Electricity running through a wire generates a magnetic field. You know, this is, but, you know, they do different things. So there are a lot of people who are worried about um, electric fields in the house, you know. They, they have these meters that do that. I used to work with very powerful magnets. And um, I went to a conference, you know, up in Monterey. And they were giving out shirts, T-shirts, you know. The T-shirt says, I'm not worried about magnetic fields. And then they had this guy with a head, you know, with a cone head that was kind of distorted, bent over like this. I'm not worried about magnetic fields. A lot of people, well, it turns out magnetic fields are a little bit more hazardous than electric fields. So you, you want to worry about those. Are we out of time already? Yeah. I was hoping to finish chapter two. Hold on.